Good to be here. We're thankful to God once again for another opportunity to come together to study God's word that we may uh, grow closer to God and draw closer one to another. We appreciate always this opportunity that is, for, that is afforded us uh, every first day of the week uh, that we can read and study God's word and we can meditate upon his precepts that we may continue to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So if you will, uh, Matthew chapter 5, uh, Matthew chapter 5. Uh, that's kind of where we've been. Uh, but the question came up last week, you know, for the last two weeks, we've been looking, uh, just dealing with the subject of uh, LGBTQ and homosexuality and things of that nature. We, we talked last week um, at length about uh, men dressing like women, women dressing like men, and the world being so confused based upon what Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 5. And so I believe the question um, someone wanted to know well was, well, what do you do uh, or what do you say or how do you deal with the concept of somebody who is a hermaphrodite? Uh, someone wanted to know um, how does that uh, relate to, um, you know, the, the, the topic of LGBTQ. Uh, and so first and foremost, you think about um, that is something that is common with, with a lot of people that are born. And for those who don't know what it is, it's a person, uh, a being who's born with two, uh, two body parts a male uh, productive system and a female uh, reproductive system. Uh, and so that happens um, uh, more times than not. And so um, seeing that that's a, a common occurrence with a lot of, a lot of children when they're born, uh, but from what I know and from you know, what I can tell, most of the times uh, one of the body parts would be more prominent uh, than the other. Uh, and so, and then you think about it from the standpoint of um, a child that is born uh, with both uh, sets of body parts um, would be radically different uh, than somebody who chooses a certain lifestyle. And so a child, not knowing the difference between right or wrong, not knowing anything about LGBTQ topics, um, had even, had even you know, crossed their minds. So, but what we're talking about, what we've been talking about for the last a couple of weeks, we're talking about people who are making a conscious decision to live a certain way. And so that's the thing um, uh, where it becomes a, a sin, a vice, an alternative lifestyle, uh, but for someone uh, who has both sets of body parts. And then, um, and another thing you think about too, um, having two sets of body parts uh, does not negate the chromosomes. So doctors and stuff can still tell based upon chromosomes. You know, X, X is what? Male, right? <laughs> I know that look. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's been so long since I had children. <laughs> and so XY would be a female. And so the chromosomes could still tell um, what, the, uh, what the sex is. Um, and so when we talk about uh, a, a person who is a hermaphrodite, um, totally different uh, than someone who chooses um, a certain lifestyle. But let's quickly, let's go back to the Old Testament. And we, I think we, we pulled this up last week. We referred to it. Deuteronomy 22.5. Deuteronomy 22.5. <clears throat> Notice what Moses says. Deuteronomy 22.5. Deuteronomy So, so, so Moses, um, the admonition for Moses and Israel was for a woman not to look like a man and for a man to try not to look like a woman. Reason being, if you think about it practically, there are some items of clothing that both men and women wear. Don't both men and women wear socks? T-shirts? And so God knew that there would be certain items of clothing that both men and women wear, but the idea in Deuteronomy 22 5 was for the opposite sexes not to try to look alike. Thus you have today the practice of men who want to be transsexual and, and, and women who want to be transsexual. They want to look like the opposite sex. Now you got, in today's time, you got women cutting all their hair off. They, 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 they getting real short hair, they getting waves. Then you got men wearing fingernails and lipstick and makeup and eyeshadow and contouring their face. And so that's what Moses was uh, uh, admonishing against. And so the very thing God told his people not to do, 
humanity is doing it exact same thing today. Any questions or comments? And so as we said last week, the world is in a state of confusion. And you, you know it's bad. Um, you know it's bad when some of your NBA ball players can't tell. It's bad when some of these celebrities can't tell if that's a man right there. That's why uh, guy, uh, um, last week, uh, well, I was at the store, and the, and the lady, uh, a guy was telling me, he said he just got married. And uh, he said, man, he said, I can't even imagine dating now. And the reason being, he said, man, it is so tricky, so scary on the dating market. Man, if you had to find somebody out in the world today, you know, most people go to a social setting, a club, or a bar, you don't know what you might be getting. Because they got some of these men now who can do makeup so well, look just like a woman. And you won't find out until it's too late. And so that's what Moses was prohibiting against. And so what we need to realize, the world is going to do what the world does. And that's why it shouldn't surprise us. A lot of times people say, you know, I just can't believe, you know what, people want to live like that. God not surprised? Quickly, go back to Leviticus 18. Leviticus chapter 18. We, we mentioned this last week, and I, I mentioned it again. I reiterate it. And so we shouldn't be surprised that this is what the world does. Leviticus chapter 18, start at verse number 20. And they will drop down. Leviticus 18, 20. Now these are the things that God tells Moses to tell Israel not to uh, participate in, not to do these certain vices, these lifestyles, these things. Leviticus 18, 20, how does that read? All right, so verse 20, that's adultery, right? God doesn't want his, his, his children to participate in adultery, all right? God says, I don't want my children to participate in idolatry. The idolatrous practice of uh, sacrificing your children, that was something that was practiced uh, uh, many, many years ago, uh, where to the worship, in the worship of the god Molech, uh, of those pagan people, they would give their children as live sacrifices, burnt offerings to the god Molech. And eventually, God's people began to do that as well. All right, so we got adultery, verse 20, idolatry, verse 21, then ver look at verse 22. Two men shouldn't lie together. Two women shouldn't lie together. It's an abomination. So we got uh, homosexuality. So we got adultery. We got idolatry. We got homosexuality. And look at verse number 23. So now we got bestiality. And so you got all of these vices, all of these things that are abominable in the sight of God. And then when you drop down and you look at verse number 26, what does he say? Statutes. God tells his people, you keep my statutes, my judgments, my commandments. In other words, God is saying, just like our parents used to tell, tell us, I don't care what so-and-so children are doing. You better do what I tell you to do. God says, you keep my statutes, my judgments, my commandments. And you, you know, uh, especially when you're a child, you always have a tendency you to, to look at other children and see what they got and see what they're doing and see what their parents are allowing them to get away with. My mom and dad have been played that. And so they will say, you know what? Regardless, don't let so-and-so get you in trouble. And so that's what God is telling Israel. Don't look at what the pagans and the Gentiles and the heathens are doing. You keep my commandments, my statutes, my judgments. All right, keep reading. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh, keep reading. Mm -hmm. 
God tells Moses, the people in Canaan are already doing this stuff. But when you get to Canaan, if you come out of Egypt 400 years, when you get there, don't do this. Don't participate. Don't do the abomination, the abominable things that the people in the land that are already doing it before you. And so notice now, Moses, God tells Moses, these people in the land are already doing this stuff. So you know what that tells me? Solomon was right. There's nothing new under the sun. Folks been doing this stuff. As one man said, we just found a new way to, to reinvent what's already being done. And so they were already doing it, but then keep reading. The punishment for adultery, idolatry, homosexuality, bestiality, all of these are abominable vices. God said the punishment was capital punishment, death. And do you not realize, even today, in Africa, that punishment still stands true? The punishment for homosexuality in Africa today is still capital punishment. I don't know if you all remember, a couple of months ago, our vice president went over to Africa, tried to talk with two of their prime ministers, two of their presidents, and was trying to get them to accept homosexuality. They said, we don't talk about things that don't concern us. In other words, that's not even a problem because we know what we are gonna do. And how dare the United States try to come over here to Africa and tell us how we ought to treat people and what they should and should not be doing. We can't go to another country and tell them what they should accept. And so one of the presidents said, no, the punishment still is going to stand. If a person is caught in the act of homosexuality, lesbianism, any of the LGBTQ vices, the punishment to date in Africa is still capital punishment. It's amazing when you think about that. And so it is the case. What the world needs to understand, I'm going to ask you a quick question. Why do you think God didn't want people participating in these type of activities? Do you think God knows what's best for humanity? T. <coughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Any, anything else comes to mind? Why would God not want his people to do, to do certain things? Because the world is saying, in Moses' day, we already doing it. It's okay. Why would God not want his people to participate in it? Absolutely. Absolutely. The ultimate purpose for humanity, if you think about it, going back way to Genesis, God wanted the human family to be perpetuated. You can't do that with no animal. You can't do that with the same sex. And so God knew ultimately that if people persisted in this long enough, then the human race will die off. And so God tells his people not to participate in it. Any questions or comments? With regard to not being able to tell when you can take the kids or have them, that's always, always been the same with gay people. Right. That you can always tell. So what is your approach to me to counseling for me to be able to say that that's not something that I want uh, in the family or something that I can't tell? Mm -hmm. Just, just a few years ago. Just a few, just a few, just a few. Just a few. Yeah. And I look at what I have is still the finest red bone in the house. And that was, and what, that was, what, that was, that was 20 years ago, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so you talk about how many, however many years was ago that was, and now. And so if you don't believe me, go on YouTube. Go on YouTube, put in men contouring their faces. They got some men, I'm telling you, when they, by the time they get through putting all that makeup on, you will actually think that's a woman. And I remember one time, one of, you know how this stuff pop up on your, on your social media and on your computer and stuff? I told, I told Layla, I said, that's scary. That is actually scary. 
Because you think about your, your, your son, your grandson being 18, 19 years old, in college, away from home, not having any guidance because they're trying to figure it out while they're away from home, and then they run into somebody who done dressed himself up like a woman, and then they find out after it's too late. That is actually scary when you think about that. Huh? All right. <laughs> well, ask some of them folks who've been accused in the White House. <laughs> but it, it, is, it is actually, and that's why it, 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 even here in Leviticus 18, he says confusion. It's confusion. It's confusion. And think about it. God is not the author of confusion. And so God wanted men and women to, like as Sister, Sister Johnson mentioned, to continue to perpetuate his will, and that was to get married. Men and women get married, have children, have families, and to perpetuate that family cycle in that manner. So. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, well, even now, I think even some of his defense attorneys have come out and said that it's basically a lie, somebody trying to extort money out of him. Uh, but then he comes out and says, whatever's happening in his bedroom is his business. So what does that, what does that tell you? Uh, so, uh, but people think uh, they, when they become grown, they can do whatever they want to do. These were grown people in Leviticus 18 doing this stuff. God is telling his children who are grown people, Moses, Joshua, and all of those people, Aaron and his sons. I don't care about you being grown. You still can't do it. And if you do it, you're going to be wrong, and I'm going to judge you for it. So you remember a couple weeks ago I preached on, you can do whatever you want to do. Give the people what they want. You can do it, but God's going to turn around and judge you for it. So why would you want to do something that's going to be contrary to the will of God, it's not going to honor God, and then in the end it's going to cost you your soul? It's amazing when you think about that. At the end of the day, just, just do what's right. So anyone else? All right, so let's, let's get back to Matthew 5. Matthew 5, uh, we looked at the Beatitudes. So now when you look at the Beatitudes, you look at the Beatitudes, these are bless, uh, pronounced blessings on those who will have a certain type of attitude, a certain type of disposition. Verse number 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. That is the ability to mourn over your sins, over things that are wrong. Blessed are those who are meek, for they shall inherit the earth. We talked about that from Psalm 37. Uh, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. We should have a, a burning desire to want to do what is right. Blessed are those who do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Righteousness simply means that just doing that which is right. We got to strive to do that which is right. And here's the thing about God. Sometimes on the road to doing what is right, we fall, we trip, we stumble. But God is a long-suffering and a forgiving God. Quickly, look at Psalm 103. Look at Psalm 103. You remember a couple weeks ago I mentioned one of the things that you should uh, begin to see and begin to intentionally look at in the Old Testament is the character of God. And what that simply means is how God treats his children, what God will do. But look at Psalm 1-3. Psalm 1-3 gives us an idea, to some degree, of the character of God. Psalm 103, start around verse, let's, let's, let's start at verse number one. We'll read, we'll read a little bit. Psalm 103. So now he says, bless the Lord, O my soul. In other words, we ought to praise God. We ought to honor God. We ought to glorify God. We ought to bless God. It should be the case that when things happen in our lives, we should give God all of the credit. And when things don't happen in our lives, we should still give God the credit. Bless his holy name. People should know that we know and we believe that it's because of God that we where we at right now in life. And so he says, bless his holy name, verse number two, and don't forget his what? His benefits. I want you to think about something. 
most of us have lived long enough to realize and to remember we have probably taken some jobs, not because we like the job so much, simply, strictly, based on benefits. You will take a job that paid four or five dollars less if they got some great benefits. Because benefits mean something, don't it? And so the psalmist says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and he says, don't forget his benefits. There are some benefits to being a child of God. And he gonna, he's going to mention some of them. Look at verse number three. One of the benefits that come along with being a child of God is forgiveness. That's a benefit. There is forgiveness for the child of God and healing from our spiritual diseases. All right, verse number four. There's redemption for the child of God. That's another benefit. There's access to the loving kindness and tender mercies of God as a child of God. Verse number five. There are blessings for, for the child of God. Verse five, who satisfy thy mouth with good things. James says God gives every good and every perfect gift. That's another benefit, all right? God, uh, 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 for those who are oppressed, God renders righteousness and judgment. God is going to look after those who are oppressed. That's another benefit for the child of God. Sometimes the children of God become oppressed. But trust and know God does not forget you in your oppression. All right, verse number seven. All right, now notice now, verse eight and following, the psalm is going to describe the character of God, Psalm 103. Now, notice what he says. The Lord is what? God merciful. You know, sometimes people say unknowingly, they'll say, you know, sometimes our response thing, Lord have mercy. No, he going to do that <laughs> because he's merciful. So when we say, Lord, have mercy, no, he is merciful. He's the God of all mercy and comfort. He's also gracious. I like verse number eight because he also said God is merciful. He's gracious. He's slow to anger. You think about that. A lot of times we are quick to anger. A lot of times you're driving, driving down 85, trying to get through all that Atlanta traffic. Somebody cut you off. And what do we do? <laughs> Road rage is real. And if you haven't driven through Atlanta, you'll soon find out. And so God is slow to anger. God is slow to get angry. And so you think about how long-suffering God is with his children. And, and God does not just flip out whenever we do something. He's slow to anger. All right, what else? He's rich in mercy, uh-huh. That's amazing when you think about that. God does not retain his anger forever. You know, some people can hold on to anger. There are some people who can hold on for anger for years. Decades. Absolutely. And they'll tell you that. They'll tell you that. And so, you, you, you know, you hear sometimes people, people have been mad and angry people for years, have not spoken to each other in years and decades. And then they finally see each other. And then they realize, you know what? We was mad and upset and angry at each other for all these years. And they were suffering over something that was frivolous. And then they finally talk it out and say, you know what? We was mad all this time. We was angry at each other. Over that? Over that little small incident? But God does not keep his anger forever. All right? Read on. Verse 10. Amen. Because if he did, none of us would be here. If God truly dealt with humanity 
after their sins and transgressions and iniquity, there would be nobody on faith but children. But he hadn't done so because he has long suffering, he's merciful, he's kind, and he's slow to anger. What else does it say? So you think about that. You know, you know, sometimes we are our own worst enemy, right? Sometimes we sin, sometimes we fall short, and sometimes our conscience will beat us up. It gets the best of us, and sometimes we can't even live with some of the things that we've said and done and treated people the way we treated people. But you think about God's ability to forgive. And sometimes people will tell you, you know, I feel like I've done something that God can't forgive me. God is able to forgive anyone if they are willing and ready to repent. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Verse 13. Pitieth. God has pity, mercy on his children. Uh, and so, you, you know, you think about it as a father, but as a parent in general, uh, and you think about children do stuff, right? And hopefully, as parents, you know, we're able to discern between childish things versus a child just being bad. And we should be able to differentiate. You know, sometimes children, you talk stuff up, you know, but they, that's childish stuff. They play it. That's, that's what children do. But then, on the other hand, no, that child just bad. That child right there need a whooping. As one, one man jokingly said, one man said he was at the store. He was at the store, and this little boy, he was about 10, 11 years old. He was just cutting up, cutting up at the counter. And the mother was just standing there, just letting him cut up, tear stuff down, pull stuff down. And the guy, he was standing behind, he just, he sat there watching for about five minutes. And he said, excuse me, man. Do you whoop your son? And she said, no, I don't. He said, well, do you mind if I do? And so there's a difference between doing childish things. Parents have pity because we understand. We, we did foolish stuff. We did things like that. But when you're just hard-headed, terribly disobedient, and you don't care what your parents tell you to do, you're going to do what you want to do anyway. No, that's a difference. But God has pity on his children. And so when you think about it, and you think about how God parents us, God has pity on us even sometimes when we don't deserve it. You got your hand up right there? All right, read on. Uh, go back. Look at verse 14. That's the verse that we want. You know what God knows about us. God understands the human condition, the human plight. He knows that we are but dust. We got some tendencies. We got some, some idiosyncrasies. We got some things that, you know what, that we just deal with, that we struggle with. God knows all that about us. And he is still gracious, merciful, long-suffering, slow to anger. And so when we start thinking about God and we think about God's character, the Bible describes to us that God is more forgiving and more merciful than we really think sometimes. Any questions or comments? All right, so let's go back to Matthew 5. And so when you think about God and how God treats us, that's why it is incumbent upon us to make sure that we, we, we um, extend that same grace and mercy and pity toward other people. All right, Matthew 5. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, it just sometimes, you know, just, you, you just feel like you just can't never, like you can't never eat enough. <laughs> you can't never drink enough. It's, 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 it's amazing how, you know, how that works. And, 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 and sometimes you could have just eaten, got a refrigerator full of food. And an hour or two later, you know what, I think I want me something to snack on. You look in the refrigerator, just went to the grocery store a couple days ago. I think I'm going to go to McAllister's. 
<laughs> I think I'm gonna go to Jason's Deli. And you still want something, it's amazing how that works. And then you know what happened? And this is the craziest thing. You'll leave your house. You'll be almost close to where you're trying to get some food for me. You know, I don't, I, don't, I don't need that. I don't think I need that. No, it's getting too late. You know what? I'd be up all night if I, if I eat that, if I drink that. And it's amazing how the human mind works with hunger and thirst, and we seem like we can never, ever get enough. And so when you think about it, so with the analogy of hungering and thirsting after righteousness, we should always be striving. Hungry to, got an appetite for doing that which is right. All right? Verse number nine, I mean eight. Blessed are the pure in heart. You got to have pure motives. Your motives got to be pure. They got to be holy. They got to be righteous. Your intentions got to be right. All right, verse number nine. We got to be peaceful people. Quickly, let's go back and look at Abraham. Look, if you will, look at Genesis chapter 16. We got to be peacemakers. You know, I imagine all of us, most of us rather, um, got family members. And, and, and you know what? There are a lot of us whose family members who can't stand to see stuff just going peaceful. I, I really, I truly believe there are some people who just can't stand for everything to be going peaceful. It's move. Somebody got to say something or do something to stir up some strife. It's like people just cannot, they cannot stand when everything is going well. Genesis chapter 16. Genesis 16, look if you will. No, excuse me, Genesis 13. Genesis 13. Start at verse number one. Abraham was a peaceful type of fellow. Genesis 13. Uh huh. Oh, Genesis 13. Yeah, you were still in Genesis 16. Sorry about that. Abram. Mm hmm. Uh huh. So Abraham leaves his homeland. His nephew Lot goes with him. And so notice now, verse number two. Abraham was rich. Uh, and so that's why, that's why I know when sometimes people talk about, you know, being rich and having money, it's a sin. It's not. It's the love of money. And this is what I, I, I've learned, I've figured out. A person can be rich and not love money and still love God. But you can't love money over God. Abraham was rich. Isaac was rich. Jacob was rich. David was rich. Solomon was rich. I mean, God's people have been rich as long as they don't allow those riches to take place of God. Abraham was rich. Notice what he has. Rich in cattle, silver and gold. Job was rich. God's people have been rich. All right, read on. Verse 3. Uh huh. Hi or hey, I. That goes back to Genesis chapter twelve when when God calls Abraham to leave his country, his family, his kindred, wherever Abraham would go. Abraham, in certain places, Abraham would be at altars. That was the worship in the patriarchal age. As one man has said, you could track Abraham by the smoke on the altars. Abraham was going to worship God. He was going to make, he was going to erect an altar and put a sacrifice on it because that's what God wanted him to do at that particular time. So whenever you read that Abraham made an altar, that was his worship to God in the patriarchal age. So Abraham goes back to the place where he had erected the altar. But notice now, verse number five. So now notice now, verse number two says Abraham was rich. But now his nephew was with him. His, 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 na his, his nephew ain't too, doing too bad either. Lot rich as well. And so notice now, 
Abraham is rich in cattle and silver and gold. Lot is rich in, in silver and gold and cattle as well. But notice verse number six. Notice the strife in verse number six. Man, they got so much stuff, the land was not able to bear them. That's a whole lot of stuff. Read on. Now, you can't imagine having that amount of stuff. We got so much stuff. Material possessions, material goods that the land is not able to bear us. All right? So now you can begin to see what's about to take place. Abraham, with all of his riches, all of his livestock, uh, all of his servants, and then Lot with all of his riches, all of his servants, all of his livestock, and his land is not able to bear them. Genesis 13. All right, read on. Canaanite. Parasites. Uh huh. But notice verse 8. Genesis 13 8. Now, notice now there's strife. Strife exists in this situation because of what? Because of what they got. Abraham's stuff, his servants, his livestock, all of his riches, and the same on Lot's side. And so there's a strife that exists because of their riches. But I want you to think about something carefully. Verse 7, there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. A lot of times in life, the strife is not necessarily between me and you. It could be between people and persons who are related to us. A lot of times you find out, as we mentioned a little while ago, people haven't uh, talked or spoken in years. And they've been upset and angry at each other. It wasn't because of them. It's because of their children. This particular child broke something at this particular person's house, and this person didn't pay for it, and so we've been at odds for all these years. Notice the strife was not between Abraham and Lot, per se. It's between their servants. So a lot of times what we really need to do sometimes before we let things get blown out of proportion, we really need to see what the strife is all about. And so the strife between Abraham and Lot, notice, well, between Abraham and Lot was between their servants. So Abraham says in verse number eight, what? Let there be no strife between us. Abraham wanted peace to prevail. He was a peaceful individual. That's why we wanted to read this. And we need more people like Abraham who that when strife arises, when things come up, somebody, somebody got to say, you know what? Man, you know what? It ain't even that serious. We got to be peaceful individuals. All right, keep reading verse number eight. All right, two things I want you to pay attention to. In verse number seven, when the strife arose, Moses says that the Canaanite and the Perizzite was in the land. Number one, we need to be mindful of how we deal with strife because the world is watching. Now, you got two of God's servants right here. They got strife that exists, but yet and still you got these worldly people in the land watching to see how they're going to handle this strife. Imagine if Abraham and Lot would have got to fight out there. How do you think they would have influenced the Canaanites and the Perizzites? They wouldn't have been able to do so. And so it's interesting, Moses makes it a point to mention that the Canaanite and the Perizzites were in the land. These are people who don't believe in God. And so you got two of God's servants out here with strife. How are they going to deal with it? So Abraham comes up with a viable solution, and he says, in verse number nine, is not the whole land before us? Abraham says, this is the solution. Seeing that it's not that serious, Lot, if you go to the left, I go to the right. 
if you go to the right, I go to the left. That's the solution. You know what Abraham figured out? Abraham figured out something that all of us should think about. Abraham says, you know what? Regardless of where you go, Lot, and where I go, God's still going to bless me. If you go to the right, I go to the left. He'll bless you in the right, and he'll bless me in the left. There's always a solution to the problems of life. But we got to be willing to be peaceful people to seek out the solution. So Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. We got to be like Abraham. And then look at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. <clears throat> you know, I like peace and quiet. I like when things are peaceful. Don't you just hate chaos and confusion? Sometimes you'll sit in your car instead of going into a house or a place where there's chaos and confusion. Romans chapter 12, start at verse number 17. All right, so now let's, let's start back and read this over so we can, we can understand what Paul is saying. Paul says in verse 17, and all of this goes together. Paul says, recompense no man what? If somebody does you wrong, it's not your right to pay them back. <clears throat> now, as I said earlier, you can do it. You don't make the situation worse. So Paul says, recompense no man evil for evil. And so, you know, there, there's, a, there's a notion in the world where people feel like, you know, if somebody do me wrong, I'm going to get them back. And, and you know as well as I know, sometimes we even, we even teach our children. We've been taught ourselves by our parents. Somebody hit you, you better hit them back. <laughs> Don't let nobody hit you. Don't let nobody pick on you and make a fool out of you. You know, you grow up with a lot of siblings. That's the worst thing that can happen to somebody. Somebody hit you. And your parents don't take that stuff. They'll have you and all your siblings. Go jump on them. And so Paul said we got to be different. Paul says recompense no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Be honest. Be truthful. Be transparent. But then look at verse number 18. Notice how verse 18 starts off. That's why I wanted to reread it. If. If. It may not be possible all the time because there are some people who would make it difficult for peace to prevail. So Paul says, if it be possible. Now, what we have to do, he says, if it be possible, as much as life in you live peacefully with all men, we got to figure out whether or not we're the ones who are creating the strife or try to find peace. He said, if it be possible. Some people hate to see peace, calmness, serenity, things going smooth and fine. People got to stir up some stuff. But Paul says, we got to be people who are concerned about peace. Then what does he say in verse number 19? God says, leave that up to me. I'll take care of it. If you want peace in your life, leave vengeance up to me. Because, see, what we'll do sometimes, we'll go, man, we'll go with a, with a scorched earth policy. We'll just obliterate everything. We'll tear up everything in the wake of trying to regain vengeance. And, and so God says, be peaceful and leave vengeance up to me. Now, I got to stop right now because if I don't, how are we going to be mad at me? And then I'm going to have to repay vengeance with vengeance. So what we need to understand, Jesus says one of the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5 is for his followers to be peaceful. We saw with Abraham, Paul is a modest Christian to be peaceful, and we can recognize when you look at Romans chapter 12 that when we have peace in our lives, everything will go smoothly. Thank you.